Okay, let us begin here. Uh, we received a lot of uh, questions um, which were emailed to me, but also we have people who have been responding to the number on the screen. So we have about four or five texts. So I'm going to mix them in with today with the questions that were already previously prepared. So gentlemen, are you ready? Okay. Uh, we've quoted quite often from Christ's Object Lessons, page 69, when the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. Are you aware of anything in the context of where this statement is in uh, COL, page 69, that suggests that it cannot be taken literally, as it reads, that the character of Christ will be literally reproduced in his people. The context of that statement is clearly connected to Galatians 5, verses 22 and 23, with the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. And so all of that is part of the character of Christ. And it's also a desire to win souls. So it, it's a reproduction. It's not simply a reflection. And it is being like Jesus in all of its fullness yeah. as he was on this earth. And of course, it's not the only statement in Ellen White's writings, is it? Right. It's one of many. Um, any other gentlemen you want to say anything? Yeah, Dennis. I like to take language simply as it reads. When, then. Is that tough to understand? When something happens, then something else what happens. Let's let language speak its own. Dr. Darmstadt. You know, I see it as the context that I brought out on uh, Acts chapter 3, Peter's sermon. You know, when Jesus will come, when will it be? And all things are restored. And in its broadest sense, it is certainly the restoration of the image of God in human beings. You know, this is one of the goals, I mean, from the whole gospel, the plan of salvation, the restoration. And of course, with this image of God is the restoration of the image of Christ, yes. the character of Christ. They're intimately related to each and other. that can be taken at face value to be a reality which is described here in uh, COL 69. Yeah, uh, that is one thing that it is often used. Also, uh, with Matthew 5.48, they try to, to rip that out of the context, try to, try to make say something that is not. Uh, that's one thing that this book here does quite often. Uh, the one that Pastor Patrick, Patrick mentioned too, when it ignores a plethora of statements in the spirit of prophecy. It takes one and doesn't expand upon it, and it ignores a mountain of evidence to the contrary. Now, this whole thing here of reflecting and reproducing the character of Christ and overcoming sin, um, my first experience in this discussion, which took place many, many years ago, uh, I just have one simple challenge, and that is this. I'm looking for one scripture, just one scripture, or one statement in the spirit of prophecy that tells me that I cannot overcome sin. Mm -hmm. Give me one. I threw that challenge out there some 26 years ago when I first began doing this. I'm still waiting for the response. It doesn't exist. You were talking about the context. Well, let's read yeah, the context. It says, Christ is waiting with longing desire. So that's spiritual, right? He's not really waiting. He's not really having a longing desire. Is that the conclusion? He is waiting, so Christ is not waiting for the longing desire for us, for the manifestation of himself in his church. So church is also something spiritual, I guess. Um, let's re continue reading. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. It is the privilege, I guess that's a spiritual word also, it's the privilege of every Christian not only to look for, but to hasten the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then Ellen White quotes 2 Peter 3.12. So I guess the whole 2 Peter 3 is saying something else. Where all who profess his name bearing fruit to his glory, 
how quickly the whole world would be sown with the seed of the gospel. Quickly, that, I guess that means slowly. Quickly, the last great harvest would be ripened and Christ would come to gather the precious grain. I, I just think that this is a very clear passage. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, second question. If the character of Christ has already been uh, vindicated in Christ's victorious life and death in his humanity, why has God allowed sin to continue for another 2,000 years? Why didn't Jesus just go back to heaven and then return immediately for his people? Dr. Damsty. God wants to show, demonstrate to the whole world and the universe that if you let Satan continue to go, what will happen? And therefore the three and a half times, the 1260 prophetic days, the 1260 years is a demonstration of the viciousness and destructiveness of Satan. And so Satan has had his game. The end of the 1260 years in 1798, now you have the period of the restoration of the gospel, and then Christ is there to demonstrate to the world, after Satan has demonstrated his tactics, what can be done with the human race who are faithful. So Satan tries to destroy the faithful, and he nearly finished everything. Now God will demonstrate the just the opposite. A generation of the 144,000 that has perfectly followed Jesus wherever he goes. Yeah. And that, I think, is the great demonstration that if Satan is in control, he will destroy God's people. When Christ is in control, he will demonstrate to the world that not only one person, not only Jesus himself, but sinful human beings at the weakest point at the end of time, can demonstrate what so the power why, of Even though Jesus in his humanity, which was fallen like ours, vindicated the character of God, lived a sinless life, therefore was able to offer himself as a sinless sacrifice to provide an atonement. But this life, this world has gone on for another 2,000 years. Dennis? I think that question answers itself. If Christ fully answered all the charges of Satan against God's character at the cross, if God won the war, why isn't it over? If God did accomplish everything he needed to accomplish at that moment, then he is responsible for the horrors and the atrocities that the last 2,000 years has brought us. And I consider that an unacceptable solution. Numbers 13 and 14 uh, record the experience of the children of Israel in the wilderness. And there was a delay in arriving back where God wanted them to be. I mean, there's, there are a lot of Bible examples of speeding up or de delaying the second coming or delaying rather God's, God's purposes in different cases. And God didn't just short circuit everything and force it to happen anyway. God, you know, We've, we are on limited time, but God's got quite a bit of time to work with. And so God is, has his purposes, his goals. Um, when you look at Desire of Ages uh, 672, and, or rather uh, 762 and 763, you know, where that uh, after Jesus died on the cross, the devil brought forth new charges. There's some modified charges going on. So uh, God didn't say, we've heard enough. Uh, he said, no, we're going we're gonna to solve, we're going to answer this too. So I think that the, the, a part of our answer is we're not talking about um, a handful of Ellen White statements that have been uh, ripped out of their context or that we wish it were this way or we wish it were that way. We have a lot of Bible evidence for this uh, in this children, history of the children of Israel in Numbers uh, where they were to go in the promised land, they didn't go. Then you have uh, Esther, you know, that uh, Queen Esther went into the king and sped up the deliverance of her people who were about to be killed 
based on the decree. So you have a speeding up there. So these are things that there are, there are actually several different texts in the Bible, several different Bible stories that would help us understand that uh, God has a purpose and he's going to, he, he's, he's moving through that purpose. And the, the slower downer thing is not God. The slowing down uh, seems to be that we're a little bit comfortable uh, here in our air-conditioned cell phone world. So God has a purpose, and yeah. he's going to linger on quite a bit further if we don't get around to it, and it'll be another generation. Why should it be the next generation when it can be our generation? Mm. Yeah, and I suppose we could say that, um, looking how Satan likes to argue the point, Jesus came down in our humanity, he succeeded. I suppose the devil might say, yes, but you know, that was, that was Jesus. Let's see the same thing replicated in his followers. Do you think that might be a factor while we're still here? God is waiting for this last generation to uh, demonstrate what Jesus did. Uh, Pastor Patrick mentioned uh, the reference. I'd like to read here, uh, Desire of Ages, page 761. The context here is Jesus on the cross. Uh, Satan saw that his disguise was torn away. By shedding the blood of the Son of God, he had uprooted himself from the sympathies of the heavenly beings. So that's interesting because even up to the cross, Satan had sympathized still in heaven. Then it goes down here, yet Satan was not then destroyed. Why? The angels did not even then, the cross, the angels did not even then understand all that was involved in the great controversy. So even at the cross, the, the angels are still not fully understanding what's going on. And for the sake of man, well, it says the principles at stake were to be more fully revealed. And for the sake of man, Satan's existence must be continued. Man, as well as angels, must see the contrast between the prince of light and the prince of darkness. He must choose whom he will serve. So, so it had to play a little longer for our sake as well as for the sake of the unfallen worlds. And if we just go to the next page real quickly, it says the warfare against God's law, which was begun in heaven, will be continued until the end of time. Every man will be tested. Obedience or disobedience is a question to be decided by the whole world, which has to keep on going here. But the point is, even at the cross, angels are still like saying, man, what's really going on here? And so the final demonstration that we were just talking about, that is going to fully answer all of the new objection that Satan brought up after the cross. So there's a whole lot going on here that sadly we don't have time to really get into. Thank you. Pastor yeah, Fred. As I've been listening to everybody and all these good answers, and I've had three different answers come to my mind already. It's just too big. We have to understand that when people have already died, when they come up to judgment, it's re really a simple thing for God because they can't change anything they've done. And, but to bring people that are alive to judgment who can still make decisions requires something that God has never, well, the human race has never, with everything they've gone through, and what, what God's doing is he's trying to prepare a people to actually go through that alive. And all in the past, the human race could not be ready for that. And we are coming to that time. It's pretty awesome to think about. Yeah. Investigative judgment judges the dead and the living. The dead are easy to be judged. They're in the grave, their record is finished. We look at their books and we see if they accepted Jesus or not, their sins are forgiven or not, it's easier. I mean, easier, quote unquote, there's a lot. But it's over for them. But the living, they keep living. And then you're looking at Deutschen and like, oh, he's, he's good, he's holy. Okay, wait, is he gonna be holy tomorrow? Oh, no, he sins tomorrow. Okay, let's wait. And you can't really, when do we, the living, you can't ca catch them for the tail or for the, for the head. When, that's why the book of the Bible says there's gonna be a sealing time. Only God knows, and that's what the verse in Revelation 22, it says, those who are righteous, let them be what? And those who are unrighteous? That means if I give more time, God, God knows there's going to be a point of time where he, only he knows. If I let the righteous, I see he is righteous. If I give him more time, what's going to happen? 
Let him, he will be righteous still. He's not going to change. Aha, I can seal him. But if he's unrighteous, God is merciful and merciful. And he's waiting for the unrighteous. But there's going to be a point where he's going to say, okay, I see he's still unrighteous. If I give him more time, what? He will be unrighteous still. So only God knows when that moment will be. That's the sealing. But that's what the, the, the investigative judgment talks about. It's the judgment of the living. And the living needs to be sealed. As long as they have any sin in them, they can be sealed. And that's why Jesus needs to intercede for our sin. He intercedes for our sin. So he, Jesus cannot just come from heaven and say, I'm coming. Oh, you still have sin. Well, I have to destroy you. He, when he stops his intercession, Jesus comes to destroy sin. That's why he needs to prepare his people to the point where he doesn't need to intercede for them anymore. That's why the cross is not over. Yep. The cross is not the end. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. Let, let's move on here. We, um, here's a text. Uh, could you please briefly explain the difference between character perfection versus perfectionism? Perfectionism is the same as legalism. Is the word legal a good word? Is legalism a good concept? In other words, it takes a concept and turns it to be a negative. Perfection is God's working in the lives of his people to change their characters to be like Christ. Perfectionism is grit your he teeth and try as hard as you can. Just get with the program. It'll work out somehow. Some way, somehow, you can fight your way through this. Perfectionism is doing it the old covenant way. Try harder, fail constantly. Pastor Fred? You know, in that book, uh, God's Character and the, and the Final Generation, they kept having to add the words yeah. absolutely perfect or absolutely sinless. And, you know, absolutely, absolute perfection only belongs to one person and only ever will. That's right. And that's God himself. Right. Even angels don't have absolute perfection because they don't know everything. And nature perfection, angels have, but we don't. And we can't change our nature. God will change it when we come. And so perfectionism is like to accuse somebody of a level of perfection that goes beyond character perfection. And I think that's probably clear enough. Perfectionism is sometimes a term people talk about when you think that your flesh can reach perfection before the close of probation. That was the Holy Flesh movement in Indiana, 1900. Uh, Brin Smith movement in 1970, 1970s. It was a belief that um, our, our sinful flesh can also become sinless flesh of Adam before the fall, before the close of probation. That's perfectionism. So this is a, this is a perversion of the true doctrine of Ellen White says, we don't teach holy flesh, we teach holy character. The character holiness is the true Christian perfection. And it's, it's in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. This is, that's where it is. In many other verses, it says, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from what? How much filthiness? All. All filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So it, says, it, says, it doesn't say let's be holy. It says let us perfect our holiness. Amen? Amen. Our sanctification, let us perfect. So it's not a bad word. Per per perfect and perfection is not a bad word. Perfectionism is the perversion. Right. You know, uh, we're living in a time when there's an awful lot of labeling going on and uh, we've probably all been guilty of it ourselves. Uh, I'm sure we have. But uh, I, I think we need to be pretty careful with these labels. A lot of times the, the purpose of the label is so that you don't have to take anything else that person says seriously. So you label them and then you throw them away. And I don't think that is Christ's way. If there's a, a matter to be investigated, let's look at it from a Bible standpoint and and uh, I want to get beyond labels. I want to be careful because I think a lot of the things that we found in, in, uh, in the book, there's just a lot of labeling and claiming we believe things that we don't believe. Uh, and that seems to be, the plan for that seems to be to uh, basically to, to remove the possibility of, of hearing, hearing about that. We're going to label them and throw it away. 
And uh, I think Christians can do better than that. I think we need, to, we, need, we need to be that way as well. We need to be careful. We don't label others and just throw their viewpoints away. Uh, labels do have a usefulness. There is a usefulness. But um, when you label people with things that are, you're adding modifiers and saying things that are not even their own language, it, it suggests to me that somebody doesn't want to hear this message. It's, and um, so let's try to uh, somehow... Uh, get beyond uh, labeling things and throwing them away. Let's try to be fair with the inspired writings and take it from there. I, I hope we haven't come to a time when it's too late for that. I think God's people can do better that than that. You won't find the term perfectionism in the Bible or the spirit of prophecy, just so you know. But you will find perfection. Yeah, I, um, we're talking about perfectionism and you know the the labeling and the. Um, you know, the misconception. I'd like to talk about the word perfect for a minute. What, what does it mean to have character perfection? And we've talked about it a lot, but we actually have to define character to understand this. And Ellen White defines character as the thoughts and the feelings combined. And so character perfection just means that your thoughts and feelings are completely surrendered to Jesus. And as long as your thoughts and feelings are surrendered to Jesus, you have character perfection. You can have that right now at this very minute. But as you grow, you will have to mature in that. But that's what it is. You can have character perfection right now. And if you're surrendered, you do. The key is to stay that way. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Let's move on to another question. Uh, what are the hallmarks of the true gospel versus a false gospel? And uh, what are the contrasting results which will ensue or be seen in the lives of people on either side of the question? Did that make sense? What are the hallmarks of the true gospel versus the false gospel? Let, let's deal with that first. Well, I mean, Elder Preby could probably give a, a clear answer on this, but it's basically you start down the line, number one, how do you define sin? How, you, how do you define justification, sanctification, the nature of Christ and the possibility of overcoming sin. The evangelical gospel says that we're sinners by nature, therefore we will keep sinning until Jesus comes. Therefore, the only thing that can save us is a legal forensic justification because by nature we're still sinning, so we're just forensically covered. Sanctification will only be partial. Obviously, then Jesus couldn't have the same nature as us, and then the possibility of victory over sin will be incomplete versus the true gospel that says, yes, we're born with fallen sinful natures, but we receive condemnation by choice. Therefore, justification is not only a legal transaction, but there's also an experiential transformation. Ellen White says in Faith and Works, page 100, God requires the entire surrender of the heart before justification can take place. And then the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5.23 that we can be sanctified wholly or completely 100%. And that means victory over sin is completely possible. So basically, you can line up those two you know, views, and it's either false gospel or true gospel. Mm -hmm. And the false gospel can lead you down the wrong path where if you don't believe you can have victory over sin, you won't. And you'll fall into trouble on the day of judgment. So that, that's just in a nutshell, yeah. two Thank gospels. You. Pastor Fred. Yeah, I... I I think I can ask a question that will really cut to the chase as to what the difference is. And I'm going to ask this question. Was the thief on the cross justified? Everybody would say yes. Now I'm going to ask this. Was the thief on the cross born again? Yes. Why is the answer yes? Because Jesus said in John 3.3, 3, that unless you're born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And he told that thief that he was assured to begin heaven. And so if, if he wasn't born again, Jesus was contradicting himself. And so what this shows is that the power of justification is the power of being born again. It's not just, well, you're declared righteous even though you're not. You are completely changed. And um, I guess I'll stop there because I see other people want to add to that. But I think the, one of the problems, one of the reasons why people don't understand and they have a hard time with understanding biblical uh, perfection and entire sanctification of our character and that possibility is because I think a lot of us do not, do not understand justification. Uh, 
and what starts, what begins a justification. When I talked with some theologians, I saw that there was a missing link right there. And um, justification, Ellen White and Bible said clear that we need to confess and forsake every known sin. Every known sin that we know of, we need to confess and forsake through, through the power of Christ. Amen? Every known sin. But then, if every known sin is at the justification, now, now everything that I know, I don't want to be my idol, Lord. I said, I know this is wrong. I know this is wrong. And you pray like Jacob, saying, Lord, what else is there? And you're asking the Lord to reveal to you every known thing that you have seen precisely. Ellen White says, go be particular about this. And don't be general, generalized but particularly confessing every known fault. And sometimes it takes time, because <laughs> there's a lot. And so that is true justification, is true conversion and true repentance of every sin that you know, but there's a lot of sins that you do not know. There's sins of ignorance, called involuntary sins, sins that you are not volitional. You don't know that you're doing them yet. Just like Martin Luther, Ellen White says that Martin Luther will be in heaven, but he drank beer, he broke Sabbath every week. He hated the Jews and, and other things. And so he was doing some sins of ignorance that he didn't know. He wasn't ready that, to, for, the, for the Lord to reveal those things to him. He wasn't ready for that. But he was covered. He was justified. But was he sanctified fully? No. If I am an anti-Semite today, would, you, would I be your pastor? We, we progressed since Martin Luther, right? So God is not, right now, God is not just... He, we are justified when we confess every known sin and we forsake every known sin. But then there's a process called sanctification. You know, next day the Lord tell me, oh, my son, there's another thing. Yesterday you were justified. You, you confessed everything you knew. But today there's, there's this one more thing. <gasps> okay, again, forgiveness, for, forsaking, repentance. And then the Lord shows you another thing next day. That's called growth, Amen. And you grow and you grow and that's, sanctifi that's, and that's why people don't understand perfection because they don't understand justification and what it is. And so perfection will be upon every sin of ignorance is being confessed because sins of ignorance, guess what? Jesus mediates for the sins of ignorance. Did you know that? Did Jesus intercede for Martin Luther saying, I know he's the Sabbath keeper, but it's okay. He doesn't get it. Sunday keeper, but he still, he can't really take that. That's too much for him right now. Did Jesus intercede for him? Yes, he was interceding for him. But that's what Jesus wants to stop interceding, right? Okay, I'm, I'm stopping. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus wants to, vision. why does Jesus want to stop interceding? Because he needs to what? Come down here. And he can't just be interceding and coming down at the same time. And so he needs to also stop interceding for our sins of Ignorance. So justification is the beginning, and then sanctification it goes to the point where Jesus doesn't need to intercede for. It. He says, "Oh, hey, they're sealed. They're perfectly. They have perfected their holiness in the fear of God." Amen. Thank you. Uh, we have another text. Okay, text number two. Uh, what impact has Desmond Ford's view on the gospel and the sanctuary had on the SDA Church and its view on last generation theology? Do you want me to read that again? What impact has Desmond Ford's view on the, on the gospel and the sanctuary had on the SDA church and its view on last generation theology? Pastor Larry. Well, just a short answer is that uh, we've come to the place where in 2018, uh, we're publishing books that are, um, that are in, in contradiction to our own message. Um, so that's the short answer. Seeds were planted in the 1950s when we had our interaction with evangelical uh, leaders. Those seeds were watered and nourished and fertilized by Desmond Ford. We're now seeing the fruit on the tree. That's all it is. And I think we need to understand something here. One of the main purposes of this symposium that we're having is to show the difference between the evangelical understanding of not only the gospel, but the atonement and the whole plan of salvation and the true biblical understanding of the gospel and the plan of salvation. That is one of the major reasons for this uh, symposium. And I, there's one more aspect that needs to be said. The word conservative is not good enough. Desmond Ford was a conservative, not a liberal. 
I rubbed shoulders with him. He was a faithful, sanctified Adventist believer. Health reform, way better than mine at that time. He was a very good representative of Christianity. He was a conservative. And so the word conservative is not a good word to be using to describe ourselves right now. Uh, we need to be Seventh-day Adventists, not conservatives, not liberals, but Bible-believing Adventists. Amen. Dr. Dumstein? You know, I was involved in the Sanctuary Review Committee with Desmond Ford and a number of theologians from the seminary and the administrators, BRI, and we sat there and we worked with Desmond Ford for a half a year, going over his manuscript. Every month we came together and then he produced another chapter and another chapter and another chapter. And I was really amazed uh, the respect that Desmond Ford uh, gained during this thing, uh, during this review from other theologians. And it is really amazing in regard to the sanctuary, for example, you know, that uh, the idea of a two apartment sanctuary was completely rejected. Uh, Desmond Ford brought it up and uh, and the seminarians, a number of seminary professors, and they don't mention names, yeah, they agreed, you know, that is, that is what the Greek says. It's clearly demonstrated and whatever. And uh, of that committee, there were two responses constantly that were fed to him. The rest was just sitting there and listening and, and greet and whatever. And that was basically uh, Gerhard Hazel and myself. Every time he produced a whole document criticizing the various things. And I still remember about the sanctuary where it seemed the majority of people accepted the view that there were not two apartments, but what was simply, you know, the most holy place. And Christ went to the most holy place and uh, justification took place there. So what is, the, what is the need for an investigative judgment? Because you're all the judge. And so I asked him, uh, are you really sure, you know, of this one apartment? Yes, 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 he said. Now, can you, Dr. Sh uh, Dr. Ford, can you show us some examples of, uh, you know, <laughs> of the Hebrew sanctuary, you know? <laughs> and he says, yes, Domstick, you know, next time I'll, I'll come. So next time I was there, you know, I didn't say anything, but uh, I didn't hear anything. And then I cornered him again and said, you know, I'm still waiting. Okay, next time. And up until the death a few days ago, he never came back. You know, so I said, you know, I said, give me examples, examples, examples. And, uh, and then he was something like, like an, uh, an artillery gun. He was constantly taking the floor of speaking and speaking. And, and, and some of us had hardly any time or, or found an opening to respond to anything. And so, uh, you know, the influence that Desmond Ford had, I mean, uh, he had great respect under the theologians, you know? And that is, uh, and, 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 and his manuscript, I mean, it, it, it infected many, many students, theologians, you know? And, and unfortunately, I mean, some of them don't speak up clearly today, but they're there. And his exegesis, you know what I mean? Exegesis, exegesis. That's, that, that's it, you know? I mean, uh, nobody could match him, except when you ask for specific things. He was not there. So that has been my experience. Very disappointing, you know? And every time he says, okay, thank you so much, Darmstick. Thank you so much, Dr. Hazel. You know, I will take those things into consideration. And after this half a year, when I saw his documentation and his response, what he has done is all what he, I presented against him, he has used against us. So that was a tragic experience. I'll just say this. Well, Dr. Domstreet was dealing with Desmond Ford. I was a recent college graduate who was sympathetic to Ford. And then I had a conversion experience. My eyes were opened. And shortly after that, probably 1983, 
I was given a paper by Dr. Ford. I think the title was The Law and the Gospel in Galatians. And the arguments that Dr. Ford used in that paper, almost every single one of them, is in that book. That book being? I was shocked. Yeah. The, the what, one, uh, hold it up. Book? Yeah. Oh, yes, 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 okay. All the arguments that were in that paper are in that book. Hmm. Interesting observation. Dr. McNulty. Just briefly, the Adventist Review wrote a, a piece about Dr. Ford passing away, and the author of the article mentioned towards the end of the article that nearly all Adventist scholars agree with Desmond Ford's view of the gospel today in Adventism. The problem is, and that's true, the problem is, is that Desmond Ford's view of the gospel is the false gospel, which led him to reject 1844 in the investigative judgment. So if the majority of Adventist scholars believe the gospel of Desmond Ford, we're in big trouble. But thankfully, God is raising up others to proclaim the true gospel, and God's going to win in the end. Yes, God's in charge. Pastor Larry. Well, in these books that we're seeing, you know, they're talking positively about Ford. Uh, in his gospel, really, what we have today is is the 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 dominance of this other gospel in our midst. Uh, it's a Trojan horse in our midst, and so what are we going to do about it? But Dr. Ford not only attacked the sanctuary; he attacked pretty much our entire eschatological uh, understanding of Bible prophecy. Uh, he, he, it's, it's it's a totally different view of end time events. But I like to bounce off what uh, Elder Preby was saying. Uh, that the danger is not so much the, 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 the liberal left in the Adventist church, but uh, conservatives who have been, um, what's I'm looking for, exposed, influenced, maybe even infected by evangelical theology. Uh, and here in this book, for example, the, the, the one that uh, Pastor Patrick was talking about, God's Character, chapter two deals with a very fundamental question, that is, what is sin? And... Part of the thing that defines the, the, or that distinguishes the false gospel and the, and the real gospel is our understanding, understanding of sin. Now, why do I say this? Because in this chapter here, the author of this chapter, if you go to the footnotes, he almost always quotes evangelical scholars to support his understanding of sin. And that is a very, very dangerous thing to do. And, and part of the problem we have in our church today is many, many members in our church are being quote-unquote blessed, quote-unquote enriched, quote-unquote edified by reading evangelical authors, evangelical theologians, evangelical pastors. We watch them on TV. I mean, I'll say the names because they're not Adventists, but how many Adventists love Joel Osteen, love T.D. Jakes, love Rick Warren? They read their books, see them on television, and they're being infected by this evangelical theology that goes totally against Adventist theology. And, and they think it doesn't because they think it's the real gospel. And therefore now you have a generation of Adventists who are being exposed to this, and when you hear the real gospel, like saying, whoa, what's going on here? It's an earthquake, like Herbert Douglas says. Uh, theological earthquakes because they don't match. My advice is we have no business reading Purpose Driven Life, Purpose Driven Church, all these things, we've not even read The Great Controversy or Desire of Ages or all the things that the Lord has given to us. Let's get back to what God has given to us and we'll be defended and protected from the false gospel. Amen. Dr. Z. The problem for 20th century Adventism, we sometimes focused on uh, basic Adventist doctrines, like unique doctrines, like the Sabbath, state of the dead, prophecies. We focus so much on that throughout our evangelistic campaigns. We just, every year, evangelistic campaign comes, and you keep hearing state of the dead, Sabbath, prophecies, Daniel, Revelation, and we, you keep hearing those, but uh, we thought, we kind of, we didn't hear much about conversion true justification, true sanctification, perfection. You don't want to talk about that in evangelistic series. You talk about Sabbath, you talk about Mark of the Beast and things like that. And so after 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years of 20th century Adventism, we, 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 you don't hear enough messages on the central pillar of salvation theology. You start thinking that, well, that's because we share those with Protestants. No need to talk, to, to, to talk about that because we share that with, Advent, with other Protestants, right? And I think that's how it kind of got infused. When you don't emphasize something, 
you forget about it. You would be amazed as to how many of those speakers you love to listen to on DVDs and CDs and broadcasts that are preaching our doctrines and that are preaching evangelism and prophecy who are infected with the, the evangelical gospel to one degree or another. Be very careful to, learn, to know who you're listening to and what the keys are to a false gospel. And they're very easy. False view of sin, false view of Christ's nature, false view of justification, false view of perfection. It's not hard to detect. To detect. I'd like you to address this one as quickly as you can. By what mean, we've discussed Dr. Fogg, but let's go back to a little earlier time. By what means has the evangelical gospel become established within Adventism? Can you trace that? Dialogue in the 1950s, wanting to be freed from the cult label, listening to evangelical teachers as we go to their schools to be taught by them. Um, radio, listening to broadcasts that we feel are very interesting and they have a lot of good things to say. And finally, it becomes part of our unconscious system and we're trapped. Music? How about music? Thank you very much, Dennis. Um, Larry, go ahead. Oh, I just want to add one little thought too, which is that we're, we're kind of coming hard on the evangelicals. I, I think it's, I, I could safely say this, you know, although we, we don't agree with their theological points, we love the evangelicals. We, we have a lot in common with them. We appreciate them. But, but as far as shifting from a Bible-based theology to something that is different and that, that uh, has spun itself into what it is since 1844, that's not our work. It's just not our work. So we can love them and appreciate them and respect them, but that doesn't mean we need to ad adopt their gospel. And in fact, what we need to do is we need to be clear about these things and we need to share it with them. Yeah, amen. Okay, uh, this is our third text. Uh, this is a text. Genesis 3.15 promises that God will put enmity, hatred, between Satan and the woman, between his seed and her seed, why is this necessary? Well, I think we understand that, but nonetheless, there's the question. Pastor Fred. If that enmity wasn't put there, every human being would have become a lover of evil without restraint, and there would have been no possibility of salvation. Can I read Romans 16, 20? Wonderful verse. We all know that Satan, cru uh, Jesus crushed Satan under his, feet, under his foot, right? Did Satan bite did Jesus bite Satan's heel? Right? Did Satan bite Jesus' heel on the cross? That's, a, that's Genesis 3.15. But look at here, Romans 16.20. And the God of peace will crush Satan under whose feet? I'm going to repeat. And the God of peace will crush sa Satan under your feet shortly the grace of lord jesus christ be with you amen who's going to crush satan god but under whose feet our feet so the the cross wasn't the final crushing it says here that he needs to also crush satan under our feet shortly amen praise the lord is the reformation to be strictly defined on the basis of the teachings only of martin luther and John Calvin. There are three main branches of the Reformation. The Magisterial Reformation is Luther, Calvin, Zwingli. Then there's the Elizabethan Reformation, the Church of England, and we get Methodism out of that, and we're pretty closely related to Methodism and holiness. And then there's the Radical Reformation, so-called. Um, and uh, the Radical Reformation has two main parts. Uh, Ellen White is pretty hard on the radical, the, the, uh, the, the uh, fanatical part in Great Controversy, but there's a whole other part that we get the Anabaptist and the Baptist from. And you know, a lot of Adventists came originally from the Methodist and the Baptist churches because of their high, re high regard for Scripture. So there's three main branches of the Reformation. And, and like the, uh, the chapter that I mentioned here on, on uh, justification, it was just virtually pure Lutheran theology. And that's not Luther's theology. I said pure Lutheran theology, uh, not the theology of Martin Luther necessarily. So uh, we often hear, however, in our publications, uh, we hear about Luther, 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 and Luther, and, and 
the fact is that we have strong roots in the rad, so-called Radical Reformation and in the Elizabethan Reformation. And in fact, most, very few early Adventists were Lutheran in any respect. So um, we appreciate the things we gain from them, but uh, we've got to be careful. And in what's coming in, in many times in our very own publications is you wouldn't know there was anything but one group, the Reformation. It equals Lutheran. No. That's one part of the total, and we, we appreciate parts of that, but uh, we have our roots really in other systems, other Protestant systems, and it's very, very dangerous, and it's misleading, if I may say, uh, to portray the Reformation as being uh, Martin Luther, and that's, that's the you know, full stop, sentence stops right there. No, there's more. One of the reasons why we have a strong emphasis on Luther is that if you take the great controversy, and you look at Protestantism, there are four chapters about Luther. Mm -hmm. One chapter about Wycliffe, one chapter about Huss, one chapter about Swingley, a little section on Calvin. So if you analyze why did she do this, then you can see that each one of those reformers made a contribution. But Luther's contribution was such an important contribution, because of course, you know, you have to keep in mind, he was one of the first generation, you know, uh, reformers and what, whatever he did. But he emphasized the Bible and the Bible only. And that's a very important thing. Uh, yes, Swingley did something, Calvin and whatever, but they were a little later on and whatever, but Luther, uh, Ellen Weiss says, God chose Luther to spearhead the attack on the beast, basically, you see. There was no one who was seen to be so bold and undetermined to go after this, you see. So that is a very important thing. And, and today, in, even in our church, the hermeneutical di the discussions here in regard to what is presently happening in the North American division and whatever, you see that we have departed from the idea that everything needs to be established by the Bible and the Bible only. And I think it is high time that we go back to this and demonstrate this, even in evangelism, that we are really the continuity of the reformers following Luther. Now, not all the other points of, of Luther, but specifically the emphasis on the Bible and the Bible only. And in order to get this before the masses of the people, it was a tremendous sacrifice that Luther had to make. And I think that indicates why Ellen White spends four chapters dealing with Luther. Let me read something to you from Luther. Is that okay? Real quick. This is from Preface to the Epistle to the Romans by Luther. He said this about justification by faith. Faith is not the human notion and dream that some people call faith. Faith is a divine work in us which changes us and makes us to be born again of God. It kills the old Adam, makes us altogether different men in heart and spirit and mind and powers. It brings with it the Holy Spirit. Oh, it is a living, busy, active, mighty thing, this faith. It is impossible for the faith not to be doing good works incessantly. It does not even ask whether good works are to be done. But before the question is asked, it has already done them. And it's constantly doing them. This is faith. Whoever does not do such works, however, is an unbeliever. Faith is a living, daring confidence in God's grace, so sure and certain that the believer would stake his life on it a thousand times. This knowledge, often confidence in God's grace, makes men glad and bold and happy. This is the work which the Holy Spirit performs in us through faith. Because of it, without compulsion, a person is ready and glad to do good works to everyone, to serve everyone, to suffer everything out of love and praise to God who has shown him this grace. It is impossible to separate works from faith, quite as impossible as to separate heat and light from fire. This is Thank Luther. you. I was really curious for myself as to why I heard so much about Luther and Calvin. I took a look at my library shelf the other day and I found a section of books that wide on my library shelf 
on just Luther and Calvin that I was assigned to read when I went to Andrews University. I took a look for books on Anabaptism, uh, the Anabaptist uh, background, the Moravian background, not one book that I was asked to read in my graduate study. That's why we've had some of the issues that we've had. Thank you very much, gentlemen. What are the similarities between the Kellogg apostasy and the modern day books of a new order? What similarity do you see there? It's an attack at the heart of Adventism. So we're seeing, what we're seeing here take place today. And one thing that we need to understand is this. I mean, we're focusing here on, you know, false gospel, true gospel. Adventist theology, Adventist doctrine, it, it, we have our pillars, but the pillars don't stand like this. Adventist theology, doctrine, is like this. Can you make the similarity? It's like this. Okay, Can it's you like make the similarity between Kellogg's apostasy yeah. and books of a new order. Right, right. Okay, so basically, if you take one pillar out, the whole thing crashes down. Kellogg attacked the sanctuary. This whole thing about overcoming sin, not overcoming sin, is a misunderstanding of the sanctuary doctrine. When you understand the sanctuary doctrine and what Jesus is doing, everything makes perfect sense. Kellogg attacked that, and a day we're seeing the same attack. I mean, there's a lot more. Bit. You see here that we have been warned about the alpha of apostasy and the omega of apostasy. And if you look at Kellogg and analyze his writings, and oh yes, we say apenticism, terrible, terrible. But if you carefully look at it, what Kellogg did is introducing a foreign approach to the Bible, a foreign hermeneutic that spiritualizes many elements. Now, Ellen Knight says, oh, I am afraid of the Omega yeah. because there's a similar nature. What you see that now the books that have, are now presently being produced is again, they deal with how to interpret the Bible. The whole issue today, as in Glacier View, was how do we interpret the Bible? And so, like Kellogg spiritualized away the plain reading of the word today, in the North American division, and whatever it is, the new books of the new order is spiritualizing away the correct understanding of the Bible. And therefore it is extremely dangerous because if we accept those new approaches and new hermeneutics, we have no leg anymore to stand on and we are just floating away with the masses. Thank you very much. Well, let's move on to another one. This is our last, well, a text we got just a few minutes ago from a lady called Bonnie. What is the essence of Christ's character that we want reproduced in our character? In my last presentation, Christ's Object Lessons 384 says the completeness of Christian character is attained when the impulse to bless others springs forth constantly from within. And again, the context of Christ's Object Lessons, page 69, of the character of Christ being perfectly reproduced is connected to the fruits of the Spirit, which are love, joy, peace, and so forth. That's the essence. So the, the question you have to ask yourself is, do you have a desire to constantly be a blessing to others? Or are you living for yourself so that you will have things your way? That's basically the difference between being converted and, un and unconverted. Thank you, Dr. McNulty. Thank you. Um, still... Um Books. I have, um, I have a copy here of For the One. It's a book uh, published by The One Project, and I think it was 2014. Uh, I read through it, um, but I want to go to page 122. One of the authors says this. He's, he's speaking of heresy, and he says this in regard to heresy. When it, that is heresy, and I quote, Rears its ugly head through perfectionism, exclu sorry, exclusivist remnant theology, last generation theology, date setting, or just the general heresy of Christians not loving one, an one another. There's only one response. So he equates last generation theology with heresy. And just further up in the previous paragraph, and this, is, this relates to what I've just read here, uh, 
Another term, uh, another little statement he makes, which is synonymous with last generation theology, is that it's a theological and behavioral narcissism. Anybody want to comment on that? I guess my response to that is uh, they are accusing us of that. <laughs> the church may, uh, may appear as about to fall, but it does not fall. It remains while sinners in Zion will be sifted out. The chaff will be separated from the precious wheat. What are your thoughts on this statement? The statement's pretty self-explanatory, but one thing that's worth mentioning is sometimes people say, oh, there's the invisible church, and I'm so sick of the organized body that I'm just going to be part of the invisible church, and I'm leaving the organization. But that statement makes it clear that the sinners are sifted out while the righteous remain. So there is a visible body that the true believers will remain part of. So if you're saying that it's time to jump ship, that's, that's heresy. And that statement makes it clear that the ship will go through. It's not theoretical, it will go through and the righteous will remain on the ship. Thank you, Dr. McNally. Thank you. Pastor Fred, you... Um... You remember when you asked a question earlier, um, what's the difference between the true gospel and the false gospel here? I want to tie that in a little bit, because in the, um, in the false gospel, justification is simply being declared righteous, and that is the gospel. And that means any change of heart you have, any change of lifestyle you have are not salvational issues. All right, now I want you to think about that for a minute, because I'm going to come to this question. If being born again is not part of the gospel, if sanctification is not part of the gospel, they're irrelevant to whether you're saved or lost. That means if you believe that, you can say that sanctification and keeping the commandments, including the Sabbath, are not salvational issues, which these authors do say. And if they're not salvational issues, then imagine when the crisis comes. And, you know, if you don't believe that Sabbath keeping has anything to do with salvation, when the crisis comes, the National Sunday Law, a person's going to say, well, God will understand if I'm not ready to die over this. And so I'm just going to be a loving Christian, and I won't lose my salvation because I've been declared righteous, and I'm going to drop the Sabbath, and God will understand. This thinking is the devil's strategy to get Adventists to accept the mark of the beast. And it's going to happen in such large numbers that it'll look like there's nothing left. What is the difference between the seal of the Holy Spirit and the seal of God mentioned in Revelation 7? What is the difference between the seal of the Holy Spirit and the seal of God as mentioned in Revelation chapter 7? The seal of the Holy Spirit, you find it in the Gospels there and in the New Testament. And that is something that each one of us can experience right now. By our acceptance. But the whole context of the seal of the living God is uh, as a response of who will stand, you know, when the Lord comes. And those who have been receiving the last day seal. Still, it has to do with the Holy Spirit. But this involves the Sabbath in a very special way. And those who do this are the 144,000 that are going through the final crisis. Another thing is that uh, a lot of people don't understand progressive perfection and final perfection. Progressive perfection, Ellen White says, is that when we give all of our heart to Christ, complete surrender, 100%, when every sin that I know I confess and forsake with the Lord, God accounts me as perfect. He looks at me and he says, if he knew more, he would give more. What he knew, he gave to me. He's perfect in Christ. And that's called uh, progressive perfection. You, are sealed. you have obtained the seal of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit speaks to your heart. You have the witness of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit works in you right now. And Ephesians 1.13 says that we were sealed by that the point, justification, we were sealed by the Holy Spirit. But Ellen White says that there is more. Uh, education page 106 the germination of the seed represents the beginning of spiritual life and the development of the plant 
is a figure of the development of character. At every stage of development, our life may be perfect. Yet, if God's purpose for us is fulfilled, there will be constant advancement. Spiritual growth is attained through cooperation with divine agency of the Holy Spirit. So at every stage, we may be perfect. Now, today, when I'm born again, I'm a little born again baby. I'm perfect for that stage of development. But if after 20 years of living in church, I'm still just a baby, there's a problem. I'm not perfect then. I need to get, I got to eat some spiritual food and, get, and become a mature man and women in Christ. Thank you. You have to cut that one right there. I've got to move on to another text here. One of the objections against last generation theology is the concept that being without a mediator means being without a savior. Read that again. One of the objections against last generation theology is the concept that being without a mediator being, means being without a savior. Any response? Our savior forgives us and he also saves us from our sins. So forgiving grace is completed at the blotting out of sin, but we still have enabling grace from the savior that enables us to, to live through the time without a mediator. Yes, you know, actually, I may have mixed this up with another one. There was another one that said the same, pretty much the same thing, but it mentioned after the close of probation. Uh, if we don't have a mediator after the close of probation, does that mean that we don't have a savior? I should have actually asked you that one. I don't know if it's, you've got any more angles on that or? Christ grace is not just justifying grace. There's also sanctifying grace. After the close of probation, there is no more there is no more repentance. There's no more justification. Christ finishes his intercession and he cannot justify the sinner. So justifying grace is, is not available. But his grace is not justification. His grace is also keeping me from sin. So after the close of probation, will I still need Jesus? Yeah. I'm not going to still need him to forgive me for my sin because I'm not going to do it. I'm going to need him for keeping me from sin. He's, the seal of God is the Holy Spirit's seal, his presence in my heart, at crucifying my flesh. So I, will I need Jesus more than ever in, th during the close of probation? Just real briefly, I'm assuming that that question was asked by an Adventist. It is unequivocally clear that Sister White states that we shall be without an intercessor during that time of trouble. But that question makes it sound like that person does not believe what is written. So if we do not believe what inspiration says, that's a whole other issue we got to deal with. But we still have a savior, right? He's just yeah. moved out from the most holy place. Pastor Fred, did you have your hand up? Yeah, I did. You, you remember when we asked about why 2,000 years? Yes. Um, you know, you think about Israel. They had a special mission and they failed as a nation. And then the, the church became corrupt. And, and then we have Adventism. And, you know, the question is, are we going to fail? Um, I think coming down to the end, what God has been trying to do is develop a generation that understands their need of him on a level that no other generation has. And so I would say that living without an intercessor, the only people who can do that are the ones who've known how much they need Jesus on a greater level than anyone else who's ever lived, Amen. except for a few little examples here and there like Enoch and so on. Thank you. Let's move on here. How important is evangelism in the experience of the last generation? And I would add, not just from the all important standpoint of bringing souls to Jesus, but what effect will it have upon the lives of the last generation as they engage in soul winning? Dr. Martin Nolte, you spoke about. From what we see in that presentation, from the statements from inspiration, you won't have completeness of Christian character if you're not engaged in soul winning. And it's natural, it's not a checklist thing. It's, I'm surrendered to the Lord and I love him so much, I'm sharing Jesus with others. I'm not just a silent witness, but I'm a demonstration of his character and I want to bring as many people with me to the kingdom as possible. That has to be part of our experience if we're going to be part of the last generation. Yes. Yeah, yeah I believe it's in Gospel Workers uh, or, Christian, or Christian Services, I forget exactly, where Alan White tells a story of this one individual who was tr uh, walking the, the snow 
and he came across another individual who was pretty much almost dead because of the freezing. And uh, in the process of him helping him up and carrying him and walking with him, what happened to him? He began to get the blood circulation, began to sweat, and the very fact that he helped this individual saved his own life. And so when we are engaged in soul winning, we are helping ourselves because if I'm going to give a Bible study, guess what I must do? I must study. I must pray. I must feed myself before I can feed someone else. And so in order for us to develop that character of Christ, in order for us to, to, to have the word of God in our hearts, we must be actively involved in soul winning. Uh, Jesus taught the truth, of course, but spent most of his time helping and healing. What implications do you see in this for the last generation? And I've circled not just helping, but healing. The medical missionary work is the right arm of the third angel's message. Mm -hmm. And so that's part of the work of Christ, um, that he spent the majority of his time in a ministry of healing. Um, and that opens up people's hearts to listening to the spoken word and the, the teaching of the word. And as the statement for ministry of healing says, Christ's method alone will bring true success. So he saw others good and then eventually he says, come and follow me. And that's the method that will be successful for us as we share this message as well. To open doors and open hearts. Uh, let me ask you uh, something in addition to that, Dr. McNulty. Um, seeing as you are a physician, some people might listen to the term uh, medical missionary work. Do you have to be a licensed doctor or a licensed nurse to be involved in medical missionary work? Clearly not, because if you're seeking others good, and if you understand even simple remedies, you don't have to be a medical doctor. Now, having said that, don't go and promote quackery. I've seen that happen, and they say they're doing medical missionary work. Please don't do that. That's such a bad witness. But um, legitimate Bible and spirit of prophecy-based interest in people's health, anybody can do that. Uh, one more. Dr. Damstey. Yeah. You know, it's amazing that this whole holistic idea of Christ, preaching, teaching, and healing. If you look in the educational institutions of our colleges and universities, uh, you know, that is not at all basically being done. And the reason is, I mean, yes, uh, there are some lectures, but there are very few practitioners. That is it. And so in my research, so my doctoral dissertation, I discovered that, uh, you know, really, if you want to develop or follow Christ's methods, then you need to incorporate this. So I still remember that I decided, now, you know, I better get this education. And um, so I was going to Loma Linda, uh, you know, to take a degree in public health. And I was at the same time doing some teaching in the seminary. And a number of professors said, you know, Darmstick, this is the greatest this, this, uh, detour that you can do in your life. You know, now you are, you know, getting your doctorate, you, know, you should stay in this area. Don't spill your beans in, in those other areas. So I went there, and I met my wife, and we both got our degree there. Then we got into the pastoral ministry, and we used medical missionary work, as we had been taught there at Loma Linda, uh, you know, with all the health programs and whatever. And we had a tremendous amount of soul winning successful solving as a result of this. Then when I came back to the seminary, when they wanted me to teach there, uh, I wanted to have a workshop in natural remedies. And they said, no, no, you know, you are not hired, you are in the church history department. I said, okay, can I do it somewhere else? Let's say in Wildwood. Oh, yeah, whatever you do there, that is okay. So then I held a workshop, I introduced there in Wildwood a workshop in natural remedies and hydrotherapy. And then the income of the students, the money, went to Wildwood. Mm -hmm. The next year, they asked me to have it at the seminary. <laughs> Simply for the financial reasons. And for 17 years, I have had every year for the seminary students a workshop in natural remedies and hydrotherapy until I retired. <laughs> you know, but I mean, you know, and I have seen the success that in soul winning, that is incredible. Yes. So anybody who says, you know, it doesn't work, 
Yeah, they don't know what they're talking about. James 127. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is what? To visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. We focus on keep ourselves unspotted from the world. But what's the beginning? Visit orphans and widows in their trouble. Medical missionary work is the part of pure undefiled religion. Thank you. I cannot help but say amen. Thank you. All right, last question. So, where do we go from here? How would you answer those who love and subscribe to the last generation truth and are wondering how best to go forward and promote it? How, what, do you have any counsel? This is the last one, two or three of you, then we have to finish. I came across the reason for this whole symposium this weekend in two sentences that um, Elder Ted Wilson wrote in a recent review. Satan will not give up his fight to neutralize the distinctive eschatological messages entrusted to Seventh-day Adventists to proclaim in these last days. We are to make plain the Bible truth as it is in Jesus so that no one will be deceived by Satan. In two sentences, that's why we're here this afternoon and all day and yet last night. We are being neutralized. Our distinctive method, message of Adventism is being neutralized. These four books, and I'm expecting more to come, these four books are having an impact on my work right now as a revivalist for Amazing Facts. And they will continue to be a real danger as we move ahead. So what can we do? Every one of us, you, me, everyone, are going to be witnesses for truth or for error. Either way. We're going to be witnessing for truth or for error in our families, in our Sabbath school classes, in our church board meetings, in going to conference um, uh, meetings. We are the witnesses that God is counting on right now. That's how we go forward. To get speakers in that promote this message and do it the best you can. I realize sometimes there's opposition, but, you know, find ways to get speakers in that will promote this true gospel message that will prepare people for the coming of Jesus. And, and you have a lot of power. You are the people in your church. You're the members. You're the constituents of your church. You can use your voice to be helpful in, in promoting this. It's not just one or two people that can push. This is, this is something you can do individually <clears throat> Excuse me, in your church as well. This is the Seventh-day Adventist message. We have a label, last generation theology, but what we're really talking about is the sanctuary understanding, victory over sin, having Christ formed within. We're just talking about Bible Christianity. This must live in your local churches. You as the members of the, here of Sacramento Central and all the ones who are listening, where you are scattered across the planet in your local church, the message of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, God gave it to us. It must live in our churches. You need to make sure it lives in your churches. Uh, be, be adamant. Be definite. Uh, don't be grumpy. As, be Christ-like. Yes. But um, as you be Christ-like, sustain the message that God raised up his people to deliver and to live. And I believe that the Holy Spirit will bless you. God's blessings will be upon you. And this work is going to finish in a powerful message stronger than anything we've seen in 2,000 years. But it won't happen if you're relying on a set of speakers or uh, the right book to be published. You as the members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, you're the ones, you're the witnesses. God help us all to have the message that God has given the Seventh-day Adventist Church live in your local Seventh-day Adventist Church. Pastor Larry, thank you very much.